Thank you everyone for coming down today. Uh, my name is Pratik and I'll be talking about uh, the continuous integration journey that we've had at Haptic. Uh, so we went from releasing about once a month or twice a month to now uh, we do hourly releases, we release multiple times a day and kind of how we got there. So to start off a bit about Haptic itself, Haptic is a chatbot platform, uh, the largest one in India. So you might have heard about the Haptic app on the Play Store, uh, but we, what we also have is a publisher and enterprise part of the business. And across all of these businesses, all of these, uh, we have about 40, more than 40, 50 bots deployed across all of them. We process about 1.2 million, 1.3 million messages every single day which culminated into about 65,000 uh, conversations. The consumer app itself is one of the highest rated apps on the Play Store with more at five, four and a half stars with more than 100,000 user reviews uh, over the course of its life. So to kind of understand, you know, where we came from and how we started out, I just like to touch briefly upon the team structure and how we kind of operate, right? So we have certain engineering teams that operate completely independently. We have the, the machine learning scientists that are working on the core models on the chatbot platform. We have uh, full stack developers shipping sort of the entire platform itself, as well as we have certain feature teams that work directly with the product managers to ship out certain features. Uh, they might be bots, they might be related to the platform, but they all, all these teams basically kind of operate independently. Now, each one of these teams has their own release cycle, their own set of features, and uh, everyone is trying to, what we initially used to do is, everyone's features, you should then get merged into one massive, big release. And that's kind of 40 engineers trying to ship onto sort of the same sort of code base, uh, trying to make one massive release. And, you know, so it felt good that we did a one big release in the month with a lot of features. But as you can imagine, it kind of resulted in a lot of problems. Uh, just briefly on the tech stack, we're primarily a Python workshop. Mongo, MySQL, Elasticsearch are come kind of our main databases. And around that we have uh, Redis, uh, React as our front end. RabbitMQ also kind of sits in the middle as, a, as one of the most important message brokers for us. So that's kind of the landscape there. And uh, we're talking kind of about the problems that we had, right? So 40 engineers trying to release multiple sets of features at the same time, something always breaks when you try and release. And it's absolute chaos trying to figure out whose code base, who's, who shipped that bug and how to fix it, right? Everyone's kind of going in trying to say that, okay, it's this team, it's that team. And then trying to say that, um, yeah, this is how we in fact fix it. That would always result in, you know, a block, either a block staging environment, a down production environment, where literally the entire team is working to uh, do this entire big massive release the entire day. Everyone's doing just this, right? And that was kind of the major problem. You realize this is not kind of how we want to operate. Uh, another major thing that went wrong is after the release was done, all the environments were out of sync, right? So one developer has been working and he's, he's run some sort of migration on MySQL, but he was in another team and some other team there then didn't get that migration. Uh, it became a problem then to keep the development environment in sync, the staging environments, making sure that everyone has up-to-date data, up-to-date uh, schemas. Uh, so even after the release was done, it was really difficult to kind of just get back to being functional. So we realized that, you know, this isn't working for us. We really need to kind of do something to fix this, kind of get to a point where this isn't such an overhead for pretty much everyone, right? Uh, we realized and we set, on, and we set some goals that this is what we want to want to achieve. Uh, one of the first things that became clear to us is that we want to have a zero downtime deployment, right? Even in deploying in the middle of the night with in a half an hour, 20 minute downtime was unacceptable to us. We had quite a few users online at that point in time and uh, we want to make sure that this didn't interrupt service for users at any time of the day. Uh, to move away from that, you know, that big high-risk deployment, we want to have high-frequency deployments, keep shipping often, keep shipping fast. That also reduces, you know, all your integration problems that you have. 
and uh, we really want to step out you know the ops team from kind of handling this deployment and be completely hands off in the entire release and uh, manage all our dependencies right so for each sort of release developers will be like hey i need this package install i need this available on the server and it would have to be again another manual process where people would go in and have to set these things up on each of the servers that would also go out of sync on the development environment then that hey other developers forgot to install those dependencies where is that list of dependencies maintained how do you keep track of it how do you bring up servers from scratch all of those things we want to really automate all of that and uh, more than anything we really wanted the guy who made the feature the engineer who who developed it really to own it from from development all the way up to production not to have some sort of handover process not to have any sort of uh uh, transfer or handover it just you should be responsible for shipping the code and, and as well as what sort of issues happen in production as well um, give you control of that entire sort of development cycle so this is kind of the goals we set out with and this is kind of the first version of where we landed up um, so as you can see that there's multiple development environments each developer was kind of just given up his own uh, EC2 server with all the everything installed uh, there were certain things that people shared, like we'll share the databases with different schemas and things like that. But more or less, each sort of each developer has had his or her own environment. Uh, we set up Jenkins to kick off a deployment job on staging. So basically, every time uh, new code was merged into develop, you could just any developer would go on to Jenkins and just hit uh, deploy on staging, and that would put the latest code there, similar sort of way it would roll out for production as well. Uh, the, there's two sort of colored arrows over here. You can see the purple arrows are kind of where you can set up each environment in any way you want. So say for example, you want to set up a different, start developing a different chatbot, a different uh, sort of channel, anything you want, you can just go in, enter that environment, each environment was fully configurable. You could bring up what you needed uh, and get that kind of running. Say, for example, someone wants to do a Father's Day chatbot that's coming out, a feature event, you just enter that data there. Uh, the yellow arrows were actually the infrastructure configurations that went in, so, and we centralized that so that uh, when uh, someone wanted to update anything over there, it would just get pulled automatically into each of the environments. Supposing someone decided that, hey, I need to bring up um, a read replica for some reason, another one, uh, and uh, we need that uh, configuration on staging environment, it would be available then automatically to all the teams on development as well, on their dev and server. So this kind of took out the manual process from each of the deployments, but I think we were really missing something key here. And uh, I don't know if you guys can spot what that is. So we were just missing tests, right? There were no... There's no sort of principle of testing things before they went onto the staging environment and that resulted in sort of absolute chaos where all we ended up doing was we ended up ship shipping buggier code faster. People would just deploy bad code faster and then what happened was uh, on the staging environment that would just keep going down with bad code that was being merged in faster and faster and uh, it, uh, it caused further problems. You couldn't and just pretty soon we realized that you just cannot have CI without tests. Like it is fundamentally it's wrong because you're bringing down the system with, with worse codes. Like it's not about just, you have to be able to ship with a certain level of confidence, right? And now this actually presented a really big problem for us that how do we kind of go back and write all these tests for this entire system that's been around for like, I would three years. I mean, it wasn't, there was some test, but it wasn't really, you know, uh, in part of the culture that, hey, there has, there has to be this amount of coverage, there has to be this amount of tests. And we wanted to go back and write these tests, but how do you then quantify that value? How do you, you can't just say, hey, guys, we're not going to do any development for two months, and we're just going to go and write tests. And uh, I would have gotten a like a tight slap from anyone who wasn't pitching that idea, right? And also, even the new features, writing tests for it, it tended to, you're taking more time now. You're taking like 10% more time to write tests for the particular features even now that you're building. And you gotta kind of validate that time 
to your product managers to whoever it is that kind of is going to realize that there's a delay to shipping this code so uh we had to kind of fight that battle as well so this was like really we, we realized that this was you know sort of a major major problem for us when we started out another big problem we realized was kind of the data and uh, being this really machine learning driven company for us the data was actually just as important as the code and if you saw in that previous slide the data was going to be entered multiple places by different uh, by different people that resulted in major conflicts of data someone might configure it differently somewhere else and there's when you merge it again all together that data conflicts with each other so we know that, that data is really a first class reason for us and it's just as important to move the data environment to environment as it is moving code environment to environment and you almost have to sort of version control that data you have to make sure that uh it moves with multiple people can't change the same thing etc etc right we have all the chat data in mongo which was used to kind of send out all the bot responses that that that's like 20 or 30000 copies they pretty easily we had configuration data in mysql so the how that fathers day bot is actually set up right what is what are the, what is those uh, just those static values what do those look like uh, the environment configuration was already centralized in s3 and also the the models that we actually ended up generating we didn't want to have to generate them for every every sort of environment again and again sometimes training those models is as time consuming as well as again if your chat data is changed and the model is different and then you have those conflicts as well so this realize this had to really be a primary focus for us just as important as code so some of the key takeaways from sort of this initial version for us was that staging environment became absolutely chaotic for us it constantly kept going down uh it blocked testing we realized that uh, it, we couldn't really it wasn't helping things and we had fixed some problems of you know the manual aspect of deploying that code uh but we had introduced a whole set of other problems so that was a key takeaway for us another one that we realized that there were certain cultural changes we had to make right we had to move to a sort of test driven development standard we had to change how developers work we had to change how we do estimate we had to change how the mindset of people and how when people get used to working in a certain amount of way for a few years it's kind of hard to change that uh we also experimented with a pre prod environment in between the staging and production environment and that was also actually another learning for us where it added to the problem it became one more environment you had to configure one more environment people had to enter data on and again transferring that data again kind of exacerbated the problem further so we kind of scrapped that pre prod environment as well and uh, this is kind of the main question you have to ask yourself when when building any sort of ci pipeline you have to understand that is this basic question answered for you do you have the confidence to ship this code to directly to production if you don't have that then you're going to be then that manual sort of system and that manual process is always going to be there in your entire uh, code so we set out kind of again we realized that these are kind of the extra goals we need to add to kind of get this system working and really usable you know otherwise it's just lying there in causing further problems so tests we had to bring tests in we had to start writing uh, unit tests or to clean up existing tests uh and uh, again clean up means you got to remove the bad tests also not just leave them lying around because if you get a test report with say 100 issues and then you're just going to ignore it or like it's another issue report i'm not going to look at it that's to really show you the problem of what you're looking at uh and focus more on functional coverage right people get really excited about having great coverage on their code but it's kind of meaningless if the tests don't really test something of value they don't test business value it's just like coverage for the sake of coverage it's not really testing anything then that's also bad coverage it doesn't add value to the test suite and we have to maintain consistency across environments right that sort of data availability that sort of correct configuration while you're testing and developing as well if your environments configured really differently then it's also a problem and you need to make sure things are in sync and all of this kind of boil down to 
let's do it. Uh, time spent testing, manual QA. Catch those bugs early, catch those bugs often. So this is what we came up with at the end. And uh, I will just go through the process now of what it takes to build a feature from scratch at Haptic. So, so it starts out in the developer environment. A, you create a feature branch out of your develop branch. You start, you once it's ready to go, you build what you need to on the develop. Once you feel like it's uh, it's in a it's in a good place, you create a PR off of it. Now this PR is actually deployed on another completely different test environment. On that test environment, the entire set of tests get run, and on the PR itself on GitHub, we will post what your coverage is, right, as a label, and which lines are covered and which lines are not covered, where you missed out. And that's kind of available for everyone else to see. So it became, you know, psychologically very evident to everyone very quick who's writing tests, who's not writing tests. And uh, how do we make sure that all the tests are running? We also ran linters on it to make sure that your, co your code is up to par. Uh, we tested for, in we ran integration tests to make sure that whatever was in develop, you weren't breaking anything else. And once kind of this got, this PR got approved by at least two people, then only could you kind of merge it into develop and it went on to staging. So at this point now, you know that this code is not going to break anything, You're, you have that confidence and we could actually start or deploying things automatically on staging the moment we merged it. Uh, this kind of, this, this job also ran off of Jenkins, uh, where it would just automatically poll, make sure if anything new was there, it would just deploy that on staging. Uh, as you can see, the arrows now have kind of changed. The purple arrow has a single point of ingress, which is the staging environment. So we would actually have everyone configure everything on staging first. All data, all your entire configuration of that, any chatbot, uh, new environment, anything would go on to staging first. From there, we'd have a little service which, which backed everything up and would make everything available then on your development environment or it would move directly to the production environment as well. So if you retrain the model on staging, you could just push it onto production. And then you could never directly edit anything on production. There was only a single point where you could change it. So even if you want to change anything on, on the production environment, you first always had to change it on staging and then push it to production. Uh, there's another service now called, called the Giga Tagging Service. So every time say a chat broke or the bot was not able to understand something, uh, that was a key data point for us. So we pushed that out. That got re-tagged in terms of, hey, this, uh, we pick up the entities there or we pick up, we map the intent for it. And then we take that data, but we don't push it back to production. Again, we push it back to staging and that data gets added there. And then again, you have to push it to production. So this maintains that consistency of data everywhere. Uh, it, may, it allows you to just retest everything on staging once if you want to make sure that you know this, this intendant or this entity didn't break something else for someone else if that data is shared, right? So this kind of got a sort of single unidirectional flow for data which was really important to us. Uh, for the production environment, we brought in Spotters to kind of help us out and that deployment process, I'll just go through here. So this is the actual, sure. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, firstly, majority of the tests will already happen on that test environment. So, the, if it goes on staging and you, you just do basic sanity, you're actually good to release over there. If it requires some sort of manual testing and you want to test thing, uh, what we actually would do is, so we follow Git flow. I'm not sure if you know what that is. The moment your code is ready to go and develop, you know everything on develop is clean, you create off a release branch. And then if someone else wants to test anything, they merge that in de into develop, but your release branch is on the side and it's ready to go whenever you want to take it to production. So 
you create your release branch as often as you, as frequently as you want to make sure that your code whatever is, is actually been tested and shippable is already been fork is already been branched out and then you can merge that into the master branch whenever you want so this is actually the actual flow for deployment itself uh, going to walk through it real quick so the Jenkins deploy job, which would kick off, would, kick, would start off an Ansible script. Uh, the first thing the script would do is remove, just touch upon really quick actually, what is an on-demand server and on a spot server for um, uh, AWS, uh, everyone kind of in the know for that. So an on-demand server is a server that's always available for you, it never changes. A spot server is something which is available to you at a really lower cost, but can be taken away from Amazon at any point. So for every service, what we do is we'd have one on-demand server, right? And that on-demand server, we'd first remove from the load balancer. If it was a web server, we'd stop USB or we'd stop supervisor and we'd kind of stop that server out. Uh, we would then install any sort of requirements that we had for that server. So any further uh, PIP packages, OS level dependencies, anything. It would pull the latest code from master. If there were any migrations to be done uh, through Django, it would run those as well, let us, and it would let us know when they were done. Once it was done, we'd start USB again. It's still not under the load balancer, uh, or we'd start supervisor. We'd run a basic sanity check. We'd hit it with on the uh, server just to make sure it's, everything is fine. Once that's fine, we'd start the rollout phase. So in the rollout phase, we create an AMI of that entire server. So we create a machine image. Uh, so this server is still out of the load balancer, it will be shut down now and an AMI is created to, for you. The AMI is then given to Spotins. So I don't know if you guys know what Spotins is, but Spotins is a fantastic service which runs on top of um, uh, AWS. And what that does is you can actually use Spot servers for all your, uh, for your main compute, your main, any point where you don't have a sort of single point of failure for your system, right? So if you have for all your web servers, which can just go up and come down at any point, you just tell Spotins that, hey, I need 10 servers now of this type. It, it's kind of responsible for making sure that when things go, when Amazon takes that server away for you, it provisions another one for you. So you just give it that AMI and whenever one goes down, another one comes back up. So we hand over that AMI to Spotins. Spotin does a blue-green deployment where it will bring up 10 servers with old code, it will bring up 10 new. It'll make sure that those servers are up and running fine and then it'll bring out the old set of servers. And then after that, the original server which we had, which was an AMI which was created, we'd add that back to the load balancer. So there's no sort of interruption at any point. Uh, you can, we can make sure that this particular server is always available so we keep one on-demand server. So that was kind of you know, the backend uh, deployments and how we're going to harden those. What we realized was we want to do the same thing for apps. And apps was actually fairly straightforward. Uh, we used to create, we built in unit tests and integration tests for those. Those ran on every single PR the same sort of way. Uh, the integration tests that we had actually through Selenium used to take really long to run. So we used to run those only nightly and then get an entire test report. And then people would go ahead and fix those things. Uh, the, we also created sort of se separate staging build, which uh, you could then you know connect to any, any sort of dev server for testing or the staging environment. So that kind of gave us that flexibility as well. So uh, a bot testing tool, right? What we pretty soon realized was the unit tests we wrote, they were testing your business logic, they were testing the code at API also that you had written, but what we were really missing was a way to test bots. And this was actually a real challenge for us because we couldn't really find any sort of tool out there. We couldn't find anything out of the box to test a bot in a sort of, you know, a deterministic way. So this was something we actually had to write from scratch and we actually scratched our heads for this for a while. Because how do you kind of validate and test a bot? Uh, you can't say for this input, get this output because Output's constantly changing, right? Output is, people are always changing and fooling around with the copies. Uh, they're changing the way text is written, they're adding sort of new nodes or things like that. So this is just like a, a, an example, an image for 
a graph based bot for us not one which is working on deep learning and uh, what we did over here was we built a system where we could test just end start point and end point uh, we would provide it with a certain set of flows certain input text and we would just test where it came to so if based on a certain input text x you reach a certain endpoint node and with a certain sort of graph value on that truth table that you have collected x number of entities y number of entities then we can validate that that particular chat flow is working for that input string so uh, this is something we're again still working on and we found some rudimentary way to test uh, the tool for us uh, but this is still allowed us to automate it which is actually otherwise a really manual process sitting and manually typing out and testing for that bot became really hard for us uh, to make sure that each and everything is working every time we change something right especially when you change your machine you, know, you change like you go from one model to another you have to run regression for all 40 bots all 20,000 copies that's like a massively manual process and we, we made sure that at least the some level that we can automate the testing of our bots and again we, it was agnostic of the content so if someone goes in and changes hey to hello instead of the response string we are able to kind of just make sure we're protected from that sort of whatever copies the product guys change. So, so that we had one that was the major backend sort of CI pipeline we had a lot of that along with the bot testing tool and the and the and the and the CI that we had on mobile apps really hardened our entire system. It allowed kind of teams to have their own release cycles. Teams were able to ship, you know, a lot better, a lot faster, with better quality now. And we were mainly, we were able to step out of the process completely, right? Releases now happen multiple times a day. No one from operations involved, whether there's, it's a big release, small release, migration, packages to be installed. It just happens. It goes ahead and everyone is able to uh, own the entire thing. So developers are just able to ship whatever code they need. And apps are also hardened on a daily basis with the nightly reports that come out pretty uh, One of the key focuses and realizations for us was that, you know, it was really not about the tools. We could have used something else instead of Jenkins. We didn't have to use Ansible. We could have, we all kind of ended up in the same place. What was really important for us was, you know, the culture that we had to kind of get into the company, the culture of test-driven development, the culture of uh, focusing on, you know, creating out the release branch, making sure that's happening. And that sort of changing the way you kind of operate, that was the big, uh, that was that was the actual fight and learning for us in terms of getting getting something like this working, getting it part of your uh, company to make it uh, a day-to-day -day sort of thing. And uh, thinking now of where we're going to go from here, uh, we'd like to reach sort of functional coverage across the entire system, right? We've reached a certain level of code coverage but now I think you know how are enough are all the use cases covered is all enough business logic covered uh, we'd like to just move to a sort of have that level of confidence to move to continuous deployments we've already we already have continuous deployments live on staging where hey you just merge you don't even have to kick off the deployment and it starts off on staging uh, API testing is just another way of testing we'll bring that in soon just to further have that level of uh, validation and another concept we're kind of toying around with is a sort of chaos monkey of conversations. Uh, chaos monkey of conversations. Right? Literally, like we go through our entire code base, we pick out any conversation that any user had, we toss it at the system and it should work. Right? So that would kind of simulate the system, really harden it, again, help us find flaws. Because what happens sometimes is that, you know, you fix something and then you, you thought you fixed it permanently, but you go back and realize another change you made has broken the earlier fix you've done. So really, really, again, specific to one model works for something else, one other, and it might not work for uh, the previous data that you had. So this sort of random testing of data, of random testing of conversations is something we want to try out to make sure that we're really actually taking steps ahead in the right direction. We're making smarter bots, better bots. Um, yeah, that's kind of, that's where we're at now. Uh, that's kind of it from me. Thank you, guys.